but he didn't mention the other aspect of it that I have also been very fortunate to have PhD students like him who don't require any advising. I was just mentioning about half an hour ago that so far I never advise any of my PhD students. So it has worked out well so far. So it's hopefully it will continue to be. Okay, so uh, the title of this talk is uh, about two problems, simultaneous diapentine approximation and shortest vectors in a lattice. I'm not sure if how many of you are familiar with this, so I'll give the definition of both these problems. It's still a work in progress really. So, uh, the proofs are not fully written down yet. So, I intend to use the, the whiteboard here to write down some of the proofs if required. Uh, so, let's start with the first of these problems, the simultaneous diapentine approximation. This is a classical problem and when we view it from a computational perspective, there are two versions of this problem one can come up with. First is the decision version, which the second is the search version, both problem description is more or less the same, which is that you start with n rational numbers alpha 1 to alpha n and a integer upper bound capital N and plus a sort of an error bound delta which is between 0 and 1. And the question one poses is, is there an integer L which is up to N between 1 and N, this capital N that is, such that when you multiply all the rationals alpha i with the integer l, you essentially end up at a rational number which is very close to an integer and the closeness is measured by this error bound delta. So, the, by this notation this curly bracket l alpha j denotes the fractional part uh, of the number l alpha j by obtained by subtracting the integer closest to it. So, the fractional part or the distance from the closest integer is at most delta. And it is a simultaneous approximation that is one single multiplier gets all the n rationals close to an integer. And the search version naturally is that instead of just looking for existence, find such an l if it exists. Now, this as I said is a classical problem. A uh, long time ago, Dirichlet showed a very simple pigeonhole counting that uh, uh, when the upper bound for L capital N is at least 1 over delta raised to the N, then such an L always exists. But that only answers the existence question for a hard, large enough N. For smaller upper bounds, it is still uh, the question is uh, open. Uh, Castles in 50, 1955 showed that the Dirichlet bound is essentially the optimal. Uh, so, an upper bound less than 1 over delta to the n, you may or may not have a solution depending on the rationals that you are given. Yes. I mean, dependency of what kind? No, it could be arbitrary, but there is really nothing which is sold. So, if it is, if the rational numbers are all equal, then obviously the problem degenerates into a much simpler one. These are rational numbers, not not real numbers. So, there is no question of uh, being alge uh, you know, algebraic integers or some other integers. So, it is a, we can pose the same problem for real alphas also, but this is already complicated problem. So, it's, uh, we need to understand it more. Yeah. He, he gives out, yeah, it is constructive. In fact, uh, 
if what he shows is that these alphas can are simply a alpha, alpha square, alpha cube, alpha and these powers of a certain rational which uh, meet this one. Okay, so from a complexity perspective, uh, Lagarius showed in 1982 that uh, finding or even deciding whether such an L exists is an NP hard problem. So it's uh, uh, it's a it's a very in interesting proof actually. It's a reduction from the weak partition problem, which is a very familiar NP hard problem, NP complete problem. The reduction is simple, but it uses a very ingenious trick. So I would certainly urge you to look it up. It's a, it's a it is. It had something which I was not aware of. And it had, that is, if you want to use Chinese remembering to achieve certain objectives, right? To certain, you have certain equalities. And uh, modulo so different integers, you want to combine them, which one is Chinese remembering, into a single uh, integer, which satisfies all of them. Then usually the combination usually uh, you can only the number that you get uh, can exceed the LCM of all the moduli by some by a small factor, but it can still exceed. So it's not unique. The usual Chinese remaining combination, the interpolation combination. But uh, there is a simple trick that this if you have some flexibility in choosing moduli, that simple trick allows you to ensure that the number you get is a unique one. So, it's, it's, a, it's a tool that is possibly useful elsewhere also. Okay. Now, sorry? It's complete. It's complete. It's a, it's a decision. So, if decision version is NP complete, the search version obviously is at least NP hard. Uh, now, that problem is not easy to solve. So, let us relax that problem a bit and see if we can solve it. So, what I am going to define this gap STA, which is uh, a slightly more relaxed version of the simultaneous Diffentine approximation problem, and it has a governing parameter mu. So, let us see the decision version of this problem. Again, you are given n rational numbers, an upper bound of multiplier capital N and an error bound delta. And in addition, one is given a multiplier mu, another multiplier mu, which is greater than or equal to 1. And uh, the question is now, uh, we have to distinguish between the following two cases. Case 1, that there exists a multiplier L between 1 and n such that L alpha j is very close to an integer. This is exactly as before. But the other case, that is, this is the yes part that there exists. But if there does not exist, we have a lesser strict condition. That is, uh, the second case is there is no L, do not no multiplier L between L and mu times n between sorry between 1 and mu times n such that when you multiply alpha j with l uh, the error or the distance from integer is an integer is mu times delta so it's the two cases being distinguished here are that there exists an l for mu equals 1 and uh, the no cases there exists L for mu something bigger than 1. So, let us say mu here is 2, then uh, effectively if they, we are in a situation in which there exists a multiplier between 1 and 2n or between n and 2n, but not less than n, then the answer is not important or we do not really care what the answer is. So, we allow that much of a freedom to give uh, or to not give answer on a certain range. 
Now, if this mu multiplier is large enough, then the problem is trivial. If mu is, for example, more than 1 by 2 delta, then uh, 1 by 2 delta times, so the error is 1 by 2 delta times delta, which is half, and you can always achieve half. No matter what you multiply, with, even with L equals 1, you get, uh, no, you can achieve this. Part. Similarly, the other case I haven't mentioned, if uh, uh, mu is large enough so that mu n is uh, equal to the LCM of the all the denominators of alpha 1 to alpha n, then you achieve error 0. Again, there is really no problem. For large mu, this is a trivial problem. For, of course, mu equals 1, this is a hard problem. We already seen that. So, let us see in between where values of mu. Ah, oh, that is nice. Thank you. So, first the hard cases of mu. This was more recent result. Chen and Meng have shown that for mu less than n to the constant by log log n for some constant c, the problem remains NP hard. So, essentially it is saying that for example, even a constant multiplier mu is not going to make the problem any easier. In fact, it goes much beyond a constant multiplier. Of course, the proof is much more complicated, it uses the PCP theorem is the usual tool available for this kind of an ampli gap amplification. And the easy cases, this is again, this was shown long time ago by Lagarius, that for mu bigger than square root of 5n times 2 to the n, 2 to the small n, this problem is in P. And this even hold for the search version. We can even find an L if it exists. And this proof is via reduction to another problem, the second problem of this talk, shortest vector problem. And it uses the classical L cube algorithm for solving shortest vector problem. So, let us jump to the shortest vector problem and let me define that problem. Uh, this is uh, again another classical problem, which these days is uh, become very prominent because it's huge applications in cryptography, particularly post quantum cryptography. Everybody seems to be very interested in building crypto systems based on variants of shortest vector problem. So uh, here the definition is that you have n linearly independent vectors in R n. This is very n dimensional real space. Uh, in practice, these will be vectors in Qn, the rational space, but in general, we can take it to be in Rn. And I am specifically taking it to be Rn because I will need this to be in Rn. Uh, it is an integer lattice L generated by these vectors is all integer linear combinations of these n vectors. So, it is a subspace of Rn and it is a discrete subspace because only integer linear combinations are taken. Uh, now, given such a lattice, uh, the problem is to find the shortest non-zero vector of this lattice. It is a discrete subspace, so there exists a clearly defined notion of the shortest non-zero vector, find it. Now, this problem also happens to be a very hard problem to solve. Uh, as I showed in 98 that a shortest vector problem or SVP in short is NP hard to solve. I am hiding away some important facts here that the kind of reduction that exists, this was a, this is a probabilistic reduction that is there, but not important for this talk. So, Again, this is a hard problem, so let us try to relax the problem and come up with a approximate version of the shortest vector problem, which is very similar in spirit to the gap uh, STA. Here, the problem definition is again, n linearly independent vectors are given and now a multiplier mu is given, which is greater than or equal to 
one. And the problem is of finding a non-zero vector of the lattice whose length is within a factor mu of the shortest vector length. So, we allow a flexibility in finding that vector. Even if you cannot find the shortest vector, find something close to shortest. That would be acceptable here. Uh, Subhash Khot showed in 2005 that for mu constant, the problem remains in the heart. Now, for the easy case of SVP, uh, this uh, problem is in P can be efficiently solved for mu greater than 2 to the n by 2. This factor has been improved subsequently, but not by much. And this is by a very old classical algorithm by Lenstra and Strandovitz. Okay. So, we have defined two problems. I have indicated one connection that we can solve gap SDA for certain values of mu through shortest vector problem. So, now let me talk about these connections more explicitly. Uh, this theorem I have already mentioned that Lagarius showed that uh, gap STA with mu uh, with square root 5 and mu, the multiplying factor is square root 5 and mu. This reduces to uh, approx SVP for mu, for any mu greater than 1. This means that if you can solve approximate version of shortest vector problem for a multiplier mu, using that you can solve a gap version of the uh, simultaneous Diophantine approximation for a multiplication factor of square root 5 and times. Now, since we know through L cube algorithm that for mu equals 2 to the n by 2, we can solve it. So, you can plug in mu equals 2 to the n by 2 and you get a efficient solution for the gap version. Now, this connection has been known since 1982. My contribution to this whole story is the other direction of this connection that uh, the approximate version of shortest vector problem with a multiplier of 2 to 2 square root n mu reduces to gap version of the Seibold-Telly's Diophantine approximation with the multiplication factor of mu. So, essentially both the problems reduce to each other. The, the, the let us say the loss is about square root n factor, both sides. I do not know. I, like I said, it is a work in progress. This is what I can tell you for now. It still needs to be worked out other details. So, I am done with my with my slides. Now, I can switch to this board and try to give you a flavor of at least the two proofs on the on the two sides. or an option. If nobody wants to revisit this slide, we can switch off the projector, lift this up and I can use this. That is a better choice? Yeah. Oh, this one, which one? That is a better choice. So can we? Okay, I will write down the theorem here and then give the proofs. Okay. okay. <laughs>
deterministic, both deterministic reductions, yes. Now, this reduces to this. So, even if this is NPR, it does not tell us anything about this. Yeah, it is somewhat frustrating. Uh, we know gap STA is NP hard for this the factor which is n to the say c by log log n. So, if we try to use that hardness to say something about this which will be great thing because we do not know anything about uh, deterministic hardness of NP hardness of this. The annoying thing is this loss, it is square root n and that is bigger than n to the constant by log log n. So, you do not get anything. Okay. So, this is the first one is uh, the proof by Lagarias and it is a reduction from uh, reduction from simultaneous Diophantine approximation to an integer lattice and you run an L cube algorithm there, not L cube, you run any algorithm there is just reduction from simultaneous Diophantine approximation to. So, let us write down STA alpha 1 alpha 2 to alpha n being rationals, then you have the multiplier is between 1 and n and uh, gap is between mu greater than equal to so some mu. Let me call it mu hat for this. So, I want to create an integer lattice out of this. By the way, there is a bound on the delta, right? Also, that is the distance from the integer that you are willing to tolerate. Now, let So, let us before I talk about this line, let us look at this lattice. So, we have the ration, n rational numbers given which I am using here. I am putting an r here, number r here which I will describe the meaning of it later. That is the 
n plus first column of this then the rest of it is just an identity matrix. So, consider this n plus 1 dimensional lattice it is clearly linearly independent set of vectors assuming r is non-zero which I will make sure. And uh, now let us look at the integer linear combinations generated by column vectors of this lattice of this matrix. Every such vector can be viewed as attempting to find a simultaneous approximation to these n rational numbers because if you think about it you multiply let us say with integers right p1, p2 to pn and q then q is a multiplier to this column. So, every alpha 1 to alpha j get, uh, n gets multiplied with q and let me write it in minus ok. And then you subtract out p 1 from this, p 2 from this, p 3 from this and p n from this. So, that is reducing all right, ok does not necessarily reduce, but you can always choose p 1 to p n for any multiplier q you can always choose p 1 to p n to reduce it to the only the fractional part and that you can bring it close to as close to 0 as possible for a given q. Of course, there is this last entry which is q times r that is hanging out and the role of with that will be clear shortly. But the key thing at least for to note now is that this structure very naturally captures the simultaneous Diophantine approximation and that is really at the heart of the proof. So, you consider this lattice and integer linear the integer linear combination of this lattice. Now, what you will get from this is a vector of course, which is a vector in the lattice. Uh, so, let us give a name to this. Um, so, let us say you get this vector. Now, the multiplier has to be at most capital N. So, that is a condition we impose that any such linear combination we are going to take the q has to be at most n and the p's will choose such that u1 to un are minimized only or only the fractional parts. So, you get a vector of that kind depending on the various q there are capital N q's you can get n such capital N such vectors out of it. Now, find the of these n vectors capital N vectors choose the one which is the shortest and when I say shortest I measure the distance or length in the L 2 norm for the vector. So, pick the one which is shortest and uh, ok I should have chosen instead of q I let me make this n. So, that it has to be consistent with this. So, now let me explain this what I want here is that I name that multiplier so, it's a, that multiplier L will determine everything the complete vector here. There are capital N many such multipliers and choose L star to be the one which minimizes the length of this resulting vector such that when consider that is this uh, then
so I'll just give a specific name to the linear combination, which gives rise to the minimum length vector. I'll call it minus p1 star to minus p n star and l star. Okay. Now we are done. This is not the not necessarily the shortest vector. Absolutely not. It's not. Uh, in fact, uh, the length of such a vector we can give an upper bound on the length of this vector by using the fact because it's the shortest, and there exist. Obviously, we are assuming there exist. A, a multiplier satisfying all of this. So each of uj is at most delta. So the length of this and length of this vector is uh, is at most n delta square plus R square L star square square root. Okay. Now, suppose we have some method or some algorithm which gives me a short vector within a factor of mu of the shortest vector, and I run that algorithm on this lattice. R is still a black box here. I um, will tell you what R to be chosen. Uh, and I get that algorithm will give me a vector is specifically the, the linear combination values here, which will give me that short vector. So this linear combination gives a short vector which is within factor mu of the shortest. What can we say about this vector vis-a-vis -vis this one? Well, this is within mu of the shortest, so it's certainly within mu of this. Okay. And what is the length of this? Length of this is uh, If I apply this, let's say this is the resultant uh, vector that you get. Actually, let me length, let me work with length square, it's much easier to work with this. And this is at most n delta square plus r square l star square. Oh, new times. That's great. New times. Okay. So this gives me two, uh, I can use this to get two inequalities.
clearly obvious, very obvious. Now I'll choose my R such that these two values are roughly equal. I can't make them fully equal because I'll need to choose R to be an irrational number. And in any case, since I don't know what uh, uh, L star is, so I can't really compute R, the right value for R. What I do know is that L star is between 1 and capital N. So I'll choose uh, roughly log n, log of capital N values of R, each separated by a factor of 2. And uh, so that is R equals 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, the powers of 2. And the one that comes closest to making them roughly equal. And it can be easily shown that these two would be within a factor of 2 of each other for an right value of R, which I don't know, of course, but I'll run through all possible values of R of this kind. Okay, there are not too many. So let's assume we have picked up the right value of R so that these two are within a factor of 2 of each other. So then I can write this as mu of. Uh, let us say something like depending on R. So, if I choose R to be the that this is bigger than this, but not more than twice, then this would be 2 R square L star square. Am I right here? No, you, why, why did I write you there? This should have been R, right? This should have been R. It's always R. So again, I get this. Okay. Am I missing out something here? My yeah, this implies that L square at most length here, not so that should have been mu square here. I'm looking at length squares. This gives me my first inequality that the upper bound on that short vector, the multiplier corresponding to the short vector L is within a small factor of capital N. So I am allowed actually it's a slight leeway here anyway, so that's what I'm making. And this is the error bound, the total sum of the error bound. So this is also and again using the fact that these two are roughly the same, but now this could be twice as much as this. So this could be at most three times n delta square. So there's a total sum of these squares of error bounds, and this is bounded by this. So each individual error, therefore, can't be more than this. So each individual error, therefore, is bounded by this, or square of the error is bounded by this. That's it. So you get the error within a small multiplier of the bound uh, of the optimal, the shortest, not necessarily the shortest, but the shortest within that range and uh, as well as the range itself is not too much. 
it remains to be seen that number of hours that we will need to run through is very small. That's clear. I mean, L star is has capital in values, and this delta is the error bound, which is part of the input description. So it can't have, you know, you can always within the length of the input description, you can run through all possible values of R. Any questions on this? It's a very, fairly simple proof, but quite nice actually. So, you know, a clever trick to use this additional dimension and force the bounds condition. This R will be always be rational. I, for the next proof, I'll go need to go into irrational numbers. Yes, uh, that is true, but that's that's kind of. Um, see, it's yeah. I think I guess you're right. This is this actually this reduction is what tells us that that essentially is the hardest case of the shortest vector problem. That the, it's identity metric only the last column has this uh, some values and you, will, you need to figure out the shortest. Vector. Now the other way around. So now we are want to re reduce the. We can assume that we have an algorithm for solving gap STA problem with a multiplier of mu, and using that you want to solve find a short vector in a given lattice. So let's say the given lattice. is uh, um, let's give it a name. Let's say L is given lattice. It is a subset of R. Now, the, there is a uh, well known result which tells us that okay let's start with this lattice being a subset of zn so we'll assume that the input is given so i'm going cheating here a bit although the problem is defined over rationals but I, or even reals i'm going to restrict the attention to integers uh, this is can be easily uh, justified in terms of uh, finding short vector because what we can do is what even if the entries are real numbers we can multiply all the entries by very large integers and then truncate all the entries to the nearest integer in the resulting uh, lattice the short vector will remain short vector of the original lattice and vice versa there is not much of a loss so we can effectively start with all integer entries. Now, with all integer entries, we can, there is a result which allows us to transform the matrix into an upper triangular matrix. That is, we can change the basis vectors such that the resulting matrix we get is upper triangular. Now the problem is finding a linear combination of the columns of this to bring give us a short vector.
what is that we have to find n integers here and uh, what we have available is a problem where you just need to find one multiplier, one integer multiplier. So, I need to squeeze in those n integers into a single integer somehow and for that I need to transform this further. What I will do is something like inductively let us say what I am going doing is the following. I am going to transform this into another matrix of the following kind. So, this is an inductive process. So, first few columns will remain unchanged. Then here what I am going to have is this diagonal entry will be of this kind. Square root of alpha m, mm, m minus one. Okay, I need to avoid confusion with that, so I'll write it as m minus. sorry b1 to bn that's product of b1 to bn and these are the new beta 1 to beta m minus 1 are in new integers which i am going to introduce but the diagonal entries are actually real numbers square root of this fraction of these betas so this is a transformation now notice that the Vol uh, the determinant of this lattice is just a product b1 to b n and the uh, determinant of this is all the same. So, uh, what I am going to do this is just an indicator that if this determinant was not the same then I have changed the lattice in irrevocably. So, that is very different lattice and that is not going to be useful. So, I am maintaining the determinant to be the same and actually I am going to do two transformations in this. One will keep the just change the basis of the lattice by to another set of vectors and other would not remain in the lattice, it will rather rotate do a rigid rotation of the n vectors or n basis vectors of the lattice. So, it is the same lattice except that it is rotated by a certain angle in the n dimensional space, but effectively it remains the same lattice. That rotation is what is going to bring in this irrational numbers. So, let us say we have inductively reached this location, then let me blow up I need to now operate on this particular column. So, let me just blow up this 2 by 2. This is like B m plus 1 0 B m dot 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 B 1 square root of beta m minus 1 and uh, this actually will also be square root of beta m actually that is something I should have mentioned that all of in this column all the entries of course, these are zeros, but all the entries above this have numerator as integers and denominators as square root of beta minus 1. Uh, in these columns I can firstly rewrite the diagonal as beta m minus 1 divided by square root of beta m minus 1 times beta m minus 2 and the, above, the entries above will have the same structure numerator being integers 
denominator is being square root of beta m minus 1 times beta m minus 2. So, in this, this entry has this form. So, I have this 2 by 2 matrix. So, what I am doing, going to do is first multiply, pre multiply this on the left by uh, by 1, 1, I should say t minus t, t plus 1. Now, of course, this is only operating on these two rows. For the other rows, everything is identical. Identical. So those rows don't change. Determinant of this is one. So the determinant of the whole matrix that gets multiplied to this on the left is one. So that shows that the we are just taking. Uh, what should I say? Okay, I should have not talked about the rows actually, column sorry, the basis vectors are the rows, my mistake sorry, only then we can do a linear combination of rows and stay in the same lattice. Just think of basis vectors as rows, nothing else changes. So, we apply on the left this matrix, this is a determinant 1 transformation, so you stay in the same lattice and the resulting lattice actually the same, the basis resulting set of n vectors are still the basis of the same lattice. What does this give us? Sorry? T is an integer. T is an integer. What you get is, uh, B m plus 1, So, what this has done is it has of course kept this the same, change everything else and seemingly for no good reason. Uh, the reason I will explain later, the reason is T, I want to bring in this T and the use of this T will be explained subsequently. Essentially, I am bringing in this T to blow up the values specifically on the diagonals. What I want to achieve eventually is you see that eventually the diagonal will look like, okay, I should maybe I mention it. Eventually, this is what the diagonals will look like. And I want these diagonal entries, the betas to be chosen so that the successive diagonal entry is significantly larger than the previous one. So that is square root of beta n minus 1 divided by beta n minus 2 is at least r times square root of beta n minus 2 divided by beta n minus 3. That's helped by bringing this fact. But I have lost the upper triangular property of this, which is really bad. I do not want that. So what I am going to do is now right multiply this by another 2 by 2 matrix, which will restore, make this entry 0. But when I right multiply, I have to be careful. It has to be a rigid rotation. It is a rotation of the 
excess it has to be a rigid rotation otherwise i'll lose again the the, the lattice structure or let the original lattice so i'll make sure that there is a rigid, rigid rotation here multiply this by i need to make this zero firstly what makes this zero i need to choose this if i choose it this way choose this. And this choose to be minus t If I choose this and this, then it makes it 0. This entry gets 0. But it has to be a rigid rotation, so that means this vector has to be orthogonal to this vector. That forces this vector to be uh, something like minus t b time plus 1. This is orthogonal to this. So at least the x is orthogonal, but it has to also has to be unitary. So the determinant has to be 1. The determinant of this is this square plus this square. So let B and not B time. So let B time to be this determinant of this and divide everything by square root of B time. So this makes it unitary. It's a rigid rotation of the axis. When you apply this, what do you get? Okay, something. If you multiply this with this, I mean, this looks crazy, but it works itself out, and it becomes. this is 0, this becomes and then of course this is something, does not matter. Okay, so that's the inductive transformation which I just described. It takes, keeps transforming it like this. Now notice that B time, the choice of B time is essentially governed by T. The higher the T is, everything here is positive, so everything adds up and B time keeps increasing. So I'll choose a large enough T to ensure. that
this inequality holds r is some multiplier again yet to be specified but it is fixed it doesn't change within and of course we can, i can always choose t you can always keep choosing t to make it larger and larger and show this okay good so once we have this transformation it's all poly poly time computation yes until the last this is the last last one nothing you get just this there's that's one entry which is this and that's it you still have to stop there no you can you can because see the last one will be forced to ensure that the determinant is just original one so we really have no control over what the last one looks like in fact the way we are choosing the betas to be larger and larger it's very likely that last one is actually something very close to zero the denominator is much bigger than the numerator so now you also see why i need lattices over reals i mean i have all these irrational numbers floating around these are of course uh, uh, algebraic numbers so i can represent them properly so it's not that's not an issue uh now lattice remains the same it's just a different basis for the same lattice the shortest vector is still the shortest vector here okay and i can talk about integer linear combinations of this lattice which give me the shortest vector so now let's look at this lattice and which is given by this matrix and integer linear combinations of vectors rows in this so what's the let's say we take l p uh, n minus 1 to p 1 on this matrix so let's let the original determinant be just p this product so i can just write it as this now the shortest vector of this lattice is is something let's say so let's say it is the length bound on the shortest vector is uh, lambda which means if this is the right set of integers then the resulting vector is going to have every entry bounded by lambda okay in absolute value it is so the condition on the first entry there is no, everything else is zero here so the condition on the first entry and let then this is the condition i can impose on the first entry or in other words L in an integer, which is an upper bound. Okay. Let's look at the next entry, which is given by just these two. This entry is something like L times some constant divided by square root of beta n minus one, beta n minus two. That's the value of this entry. C is an integer plus p one times sorry p n minus one times square root of this one okay 
and this in absolute value should be less than or equal to lambda. Now let us just do some arithmetic here, multiply this whole thing by multiplies everything by square root of beta n minus 1 times beta n minus 2 and then divide by beta n minus 1, you get this. Now, this is a number that I can compute. This is essentially the number which is given by this entry. And what this is telling us, this inequality, that when you multiply this number with L, you get an integer. And the difference from that integer is this much. Now, the choice of beta n and beta n and beta n minus 2, we have chosen, we we'll choose in a way so that this becomes very tiny, very close to 0. that multiplying factor of r that we are going to choose, we will choose in a way so that this becomes very close to 0. Lambda is, we know, of course, shortest vector length we know, otherwise we can guess also, that is not an issue. Minkowski theorem does not give us, gives us a very good approximation of lambda and I can do a binary search to find out the right value. Uh, so, so, there is this condition, therefore, and the first condition is, of course, L is bounded up to this above. This condition is telling us L multiplied to this rational number is bringing me close to an integer and this close. Now, I am not bore you with the remaining calculation. Every You do the rest of the everything in more gory detail. Everything ends up with this. L times a rational number is close to an integer. The integer is given by this values and the closeness is given by this error. So, this translates the problem that is you can compute all of these rational numbers easily. So, you get n minus 1 rational numbers and what you are looking for a multiplier L, integer multiplier of L up, up to this point which simultaneously brings them close to integer which is exactly SDA. Now, if you can solve SDA within a factor of mu, then just reverting it back, you get a factor of mu, you will lose square root n because every entry you have bounded by lambda, which is the shortest vector length. Actually, it could have been spread over this. So, there is a natural square root n factor of loss there. And there are some constant factor losses along the way. And that is reduction. Yes. So, notice the way it is. The condition that I imposed is, where is that? Okay, condition is gone. So, beta n minus 1 by beta n minus 2 square root is greater than or equal to r. That is the condition. Now, this I can write inductively therefore as so this is some r to the uh, something like uh, 1 n minus 2 square root of beta 1. So, this is at least this much. So, this is the inverse of that. So, this is really, really small. 
and I can choose R such that uh, it just kills off lambda multiplier without any problem. Yes, C by beta n. These are these will feed into this. Yeah, correct. That's it is C by beta n. This gets picked off from here, but subsequent ones, there were multiple entries, so they'll just get weight. There will be a weighted combination of those. This will be the capital int. Yeah, some integral approximate, the closest integer. Sorry? Yeah, lambda, uh, we can assume that we know lambda. You solve it and then you do a binary search for the lambda and solve it further. The moment you look at L infinity, yeah, I thought too, but it's a disaster. Today morning it struck me that that right hand multiplying, that rigid rotation that kills, it has the only norm it works in L2 norm. Yeah, until yesterday night I thought that I have a much tighter correspondence in L infinity norm. It is not. Okay, so that's it. It complicated in this one. Okay. So it's a, it's a. I mean, a priori, it is hard to see that you can kind of you know, shrink those n numbers into just finding one appropriate multiplier. But uh, you know, with this little bit of jugglery, it does work out. Yes. No, okay. <laughs> I mean, work in progress with. I mean, I mean, I realized something today morning. So, and I have kind of not told you some finer details, which uh, I think I have worked out, but I still need to verify everything. But broadly, this proof is I'm pretty confident about in this. But what further comes out of this is still, I think this is there is something here which I would like to look more closely and spend some time on it. Because uh, this, uh, the reduction that you get, I mean, there is a certain amount of flexibility here, the kind of lattices you are getting. And uh, I mean, the transformation of a lattice into a, uh, the basis into a new one. And this has some nice properties which perhaps can be used in other ways also. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be a way to, I mean, it comes out of very naturally out of this, yeah, the norm, because it's essentially norm based and the L2 norms. The moment you in focus on individual coordinates and then go to L2 norm, you lose square root n. Now, natural thing will be L infinity norm, but then you can't do this transformation at all. 